All right. Looks like we've got uh, critical mass and we're going to keep moving as other people log in. Welcome everyone um, to When Language is Not Enough, a conversation between Leslie Desher Kenosi and photographer Karen Marshall on long-term projects um, using Karen Marshall's 30-year documentary project Between Girls and the production of her forthcoming photo book of the same name as the catalyst for this discussion. My name is Shelley Hahn. I'm the, a vice president at Focus on the Story. I'm joined by Tom Petswinkler, who's handling um, the tech side for us today. And we're excited to welcome you to today's discussion. This is a second collaboration with Leslie um, and we're uh, between uh, Focus on the Story and Leslie and we're really excited about it. Um, last year, as we navigated a fully online photo festival, um, Leslie moderated an incredible panel of women um, who were documenting the front lines of protest. Um, and her panel was titled Urgent Pictures, Photographs of Unrest Reconsidered. And she also um, talked to us about her ongoing personal photographic project, Domestic Negotiations, which explores autonomy, partnership, and the role of the mother as an artist. Before we dive into today's conversation, we want to take a minute to remember that today is Juneteenth, a day which celebrates the eman emancipation of the enslaved um, people in Galveston, Texas, on June 19, 1865. And it's widely recognized as the official end of slavery um, in the United States, despite the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by uh, President Lincoln two and a half years earlier. Um, so thank you for joining us on this day of hope and celebration. And I hope that you will find time to celebrate um, and also to take action. Um, I'm going to put a couple of links into the chat um, during, uh, during this talk. I'm gonna attend a celebration tonight online. Um, so I'll include a link to that. And then there's also a bill in Congress that you might want to take a look at. It's going to create a commission to examine the institution of slavery in the United States, its legacy and make recommendations for reparations. Um, it's called HR 40. And if you live in the United States, I hope that you'll take a moment to learn about the bill. So I'm very honored now to introduce our guest speakers. Karen Marshall is a documentary photographer um, sorry, we've got Leslie up there, so I can, okay, we'll go backwards. Sorry, I, I messed up the order. Karen Marshall is a documentary photographer whose work examines the psychological lives of her subjects within the social landscape. Her photographs have appeared in numerous mag uh, publications, including the New York Times Magazine, the London Sunday Times, The Atlantic, New York Magazine, NPR Picture Show, Gope Magazine, Dazed, and PDN, and she has exhibited internationally. Marshall is the recipient of artist fellowships and sponsorships through the New York Foundation for the Arts, as well as grants and support from private foundations. Nominated for a Prix Paquette in 2011, her work is part of several collections, including the Feminist Art Base at the Brooklyn Museum. Marshall is chair of the Documentary Practice and Visual Journalism Program at the International Center of Photography in New York City. In addition to ICP, she has taught numerous workshops internationally is an associate professor at New York University and mentors MFA candidates at the Maine Media Workshops and College in Rockport, Maine. And then if we can go back to Leslie's photo. Um, Leslie Deschler Kenosi is a photographer, a photography educator and a cultural producer. She holds an MFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art and is a faculty member at the International Center of Photography. She has taught at Columbia University the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Lamar Dodd School of Art in Cortona, Italy. In 2016, she co-created Women Picturing Revolution, an organization <clears throat> dedicated to female photographers who have documented conflicts, crises, and revolutions in private realms and public spaces. WPR is currently editing a volume on the representations of Black motherhood in photography which will be uh, published by Leuven University Press in spring of 2022. Really looking forward to seeing that. Um, Leslie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Shelley, for that warm introduction. And thank you to focus on the story. I'm thrilled to be here um, again. And I really want to say heartfelt that I think this festival was really one to watch. And the programming already is phenomenal, both in person and online and the archive collection of these these, these talks is really phenomenal. I turn to it often in the classroom. So check that out. And Karen, welcome. How are you? Good morning. Good. Good morning. <laughs> good. Thank you for being here. I know. Wonderful to be here. 
Yeah, so it's been, so we have a relationship already as we both are educators at the International Center of Photography. So I just have to get this out of the way that over the years, I have worked with many students and colleagues who've worked with you and I wanna get the teacher part of over, over with so we can get to you as the okay. artist. But from everything I've heard, your ability to um, you know, bring out projects and, and help students work with long-term projects, just editing, sequencing, really getting to the heart of both what they actually want to do, which is a process, mm -hmm. and to complete bodies work and then giving them the, the wings that they need to move on to the next steps I've always heard that you're just the best that you are, you know, so not to embarrass you, but so I just want to share that with you that I've also been looking at this project for a long time and I'm really just thrilled and honored to sit with you and, and discuss this next iteration of Between Girls. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I think what we might do is uh, we'll dig into the book, the actual book that's coming out, but there's many iterations that led up to this this 30 year project. Um, and then we'll, we'll start talking about maybe the book um, production and what's next for it at, at about midway through. How's that sound? That sounds great. Okay. So um, we'll get right into it. Let's see, I'm going to share my screen. Um, it says host has disabled the participant sharing. So I just need to get the sharing. I know. Okay, sorry, I'm going to do that. No, no. Right I know you probably didn't expect me to get into it so soon, but I want to, we have a lot to cover with Karen. No, I just thought that you could already do that. It's so, fine. Um, and it should allow you to do that. So I'm going to make right. a co-host so we can be sure to do that. There we so, go. There yeah. we go. Okay. I know we're all spending so much time on these Zooms, but we still have so many, uh, there's always a little hiccup. So let's see here. Oops. All right. How's that? We see the screen? Looks good. All right, Karen. So I feel as if if people showed up today, they probably know a little bit about the project. Um, but I would love to go through just a brief, um, you know, introduction of how you started this project in 2000, sorry, in, in 1985. Mm -hmm. Where were you in your life location wise? You were just a few years or a little bit older than the actual girls in the project. Yeah, I was in my 20s and I was a young aspiring photographer in New York City. Um, I had been, I started photography when I was 13. So it's kind of interesting that I ended up working on a project about coming of age because I discovered photography as I came of age. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are a number of different reasons that, that made me go with this project. One was that I had been, I came of age during the women's consciousness raising movement in the United States. And so I was very, very influenced uh, by this idea of women's identity and what they share with each other as a young person. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, I kind of looked around and nobody was really talking about the women's movement anymore or what that meant. And I was looking for something, I, I had this desire to move inside. I had been documenting uh, a lot of the United States using a two and a quarter roll of flex and doing environmental portraits on the street. And I just didn't really want to work in the public space anymore. I wanted to find something very internal. And I also wanted to experiment with this notion of using documentary inquiry to talk about something more psychological. Mm -hmm. And I one last thing about it is that I also decided that I wanted to work on something that had to do with how people get along because I thought that there was a tendency often for people to look at conflict. And mm -hmm. I said, let's look at the opposite. Let's look at how we get along. And so that's how it sort of began. Mm. So thank you for that. And one thing I do want to mention is all of your, um, it seems up until this point and ongoing long-term really deep dives into projects is really what is in your what is part of your practice so i do recommend that people check out the other projects for today we're just focusing on this but i do want to mention that conflict you and i spoke about that so you know as shelly mentioned in our work with wpr we highlight the word conflict but for us it's both political uh you know oppressive situations but it's also the personal right that personal way that we quietly hold conflict so I just wanted to highlight that as we speak about that conflict today with the young in within the lives of the young women, perhaps, or how they how they move within that space of of women, right? I think that's what you're interested in. 
Yeah, and I also felt like the language that women share with each other really was never anything that was discussed, especially in visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that um, that really, what did that mean? And it's such, it, how, what girls share with each other is very, very verbal, but it had never been explained in pictures, in my mm -hmm. opinion, mm -hmm. by women, women for women. And that was where I, my premise was at the mm -hmm. time. So this is Molly, who's, you know, central to the whole story. Do you, do you feel like you'd like to just share a little bit about some of these early pictures? And this is 85, 86, 85. This is 85. It, okay. it may be January of 86, but I think this is, this is early on in my, okay. in my uh, starting to photograph. I started in September of 1985. I, when I decided I wanted to uh, photograph girls, I started asking everybody I know, did they know any teenagers? So there were actually a number of teenagers I photographed, but when I was finally introduced to Molly, I knew immediately before I even met her, but talking to her on the phone that this was, she understood completely what I was looking for. Mm. And so she was my, my base. She was the center of this. And she introduced me to the whole network of girls that she knew in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the other thing I had made a decision immediately about uh, was that I was interested in looking at what I would call then in 1985 middle class girls who went to public high school. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to I didn't want to talk about like the poverty line, and I also didn't want to talk about the uber rich. I wanted sort of this middle ground because I wasn't this wasn't an economic story. It was a, it was a, a girl story. And that was, mm -hmm. that was my basis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I just, this image I have to share, I feel it'll resonate. This certainly resonates with me. I'm exactly the, the moment of these, this is Molly's bedroom or Molly's room. Mm -hmm. And then this is a group of um, friends. And I wanted to share one thing about the, the book that I find so intriguing and, and, and really just so successful is, and we'll get into it, is these little hints into their lives that are spread throughout the book. It's not set up um, in a linear, I mean, it's linear, but it's also non-linear uh, the way you have it set up because there's a photograph, there's audio, there's video, there's all kinds of medias you're working with. But in the back of the book, there's a list of, I, want, I don't want to say stats because it feels a bit cold, but the way you have this is, it's quite, it's great. So I'm just going to read a bit to, to place, give some context. Uh, it's a list. Most of the women were born between 1969 and grew up in middle-class New York City in the 80s. 80% 80 had divorced parents and lived primarily with their mothers. Uh, the majority of the mothers worked full-time. Um, they were, you know, like many of us, they attended daycare and were later latchkey kids, which made them independent and self-sufficient. Uh, they were students from the Bronx High School Science of Science, LaGuardia High School Music and Arts, um, both large specialty New York City public high schools for academically and artistic gifted students, just a couple more. Most of them lived in rent controlled apartments. Their parents were political and social activists, rock and roll musicians, teachers, designers, real estate agents, midwives, cameramen, lawyers, dentists. Uh, so here's the scene of New York City at the time. New York City grew up, was growing out of uh, bankruptcy. During the eighties, there was a large crack epidemic, AIDS crisis and thousands of gay men dying each week and a homeless population that would triple in size before the end of the decade. And then just pop culture, which I love, Karen, that you've included. Madonna's Like a Virgin was number two, and The Breakfast Club had just come out, the John Hughes film. <laughs> so we're all back in our time machines right now. Uh, so can you tell me, you know, the idea of this, this at the very end of the book, how that came, you know, that you decided to just put those stats? Because I think Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of uh, documentary storytelling at, at this point in time, adding this extra context is, is very important. You know, it gives a voice to the subject as well. Yeah, I actually use very, one of the things if you uh, purchase the book or end up seeing my installation at some point is that I don't really use that much text. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, I realized that you had to give some kind of overview of what the backstory of what these particular women were experiencing. So I, I just started kind of, I, it was all like in longer narrative writing. And then I kind of literally put it into stats because these are facts, facts about the landscape that, mm -hmm. that existed for them. And a lot of times we, you know, I realized when I first created these stats, which is about maybe five years ago or so, 
was that um, what New York City was, what Manhattan was, was completely different yeah. than what it is now. And mm -hmm. so I needed to kind of point that out. Mm, I love it. It was an affordable place to live for a lot of people or for more people than it is now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the apartments that they lived in uh, are now multi-million dollar uh, condos and co-ops, but they weren't then. They were, you know, rent stabilized and rent controlled apartments. Mm -hmm. And we'll get a peek, you know, later on in, in a few minutes about, um, cause you photographed them as recently as 2015 was the last 2015. One. So that's the span. Okay. So tell me, tell us what it was like, you know, they, they would call you up or you would just check in with them. What's the, what's the practice <laughs> of one that approaches, you know, strangers and gets to know them through this intimate way. And okay. So I met Molly through some people I knew, um, and in those days, it parents weren't like, you know, helicoptering over their children in the same way. And remember these children basically were latchkey kids. So I'm not saying their parents were negligent because their parents yeah. were not negligent. It just was different, yeah. It was just different. There was no cell phones, there was no internet, none of that. But Molly, as an example, had her own phone line that she shared with her sister, landline. So mm -hmm. that's how my original contact was. But let me just say over, over the several months that I was you know, intensively documenting them, it was all through landline conversations or when I was with them as to when then I would meet up with them. And, uh, you know, I never knew. I was always on the edge of my seat because they were teenagers. So I never knew if they were actually going to remember mm -hmm. to show up or that I was showing up, but it always worked out great. Mm -hmm. And they were into it. So it was easy <laughs> yeah. in that sense. But it is not, you know, I definitely felt like I was, you know, flying by the seat of my pants sometimes <laughs> if, you know, I was getting there and they would be there or not. Right. Of course. And, and what, you know, it seems like, especially with this image and a couple others that you had, you know, you were fully um, immersed with the girls. Did you learn anything about their language? Did when they were speaking to one another, were you just transported back to your teenage years? Um, and we've talked about how this link, this kind of con communication just continues. Hopefully we don't have as much time as adults to have these relationships. Right. And we'll see that in the later photographs, but yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, is that, is that there's a universality to what young, uh, young people and young women share with one another. So, uh, you know, like as an example in this image, they were having kind of like what I'll call a weekend sleepover, mm -hmm. uh, you know, parents were not around for the weekend, but the kids were responsible and all the women, um, you know, all the girls were hanging out. So I did not sleep over there, but I came over <laughs> maybe in the late morning, early afternoon and hung out with them for like five hours. Right. And the thing about these particular girls is that they let me just be there. And I was a fly on the wall, though, let me say, I was also talking to them. It's not like I was like some ghost in the right. room. Uh, and they enjoyed me too. I was like an older sister. I was not old enough to be um, their parent whatsoever. I was a slightly different generation than their parents, but I was a little too old to have been their like older, older sister. So I think that that uh, also helped in a sense. Um, and, you know, so yeah, that was that. I just, they weren't performing for me. They were no. doing what they do. Um, but I, I just guess I made them feel comfortable to just hang because I was hanging out. Yeah. yeah. Then that's apparent in, in all of the images, Karen. So I wanted to include a few just uh, hanging out. This is Molly and Jen, who we'll see Jen later. And this is like at a, this is, you know, this is a typical New York City thing that can happen, which is somebody decided to have a party and they were able to figure pool resources and they or and they like rented some place called the Polish Club. I remember it was on the Upper East Side. I couldn't believe the massive amount of kids who were there. I mean, I knew a lot of them, but it was like, who rents a Polish club? I don't know. It's just some crazy thing. But I think too, you know, I work with a lot of New York City teens as well. And and that is not where I grew up. And we had a lot more space in our in our you know, at home where kids get really smart about, they need a space, they can't do it in their apartment, you know, I love that, I love that. And also in this, you know, the, the, in the beginning part of the book, it's just the girls together. And then you see more, you know, more friends and others come in the story um, throughout, such as this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, you know, there'd be, as I said, there'd be varying like weekend hangouts, but sometimes after school as well in their houses or out in public and diners and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just a few more. And this picture obviously speaks so beautifully to the intimacy between the girls and the friendship. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I should you know, the, the thing that happened, I actually am going to explain this picture because I think yes. it's important. So mm. 10, and it also goes into even how the construction of the book and how you deal with it is. Mm -hmm. So 10 months into this project, which was July of 1986, they were on vacation from summer vacation. It was between their junior and senior year. And Molly Brover uh, was on vacation in Cape Cod. And uh, it's a long story, but she ended up uh, getting off a bus and walking in front of it into traffic and was hit by a car and killed. Mm. So the main, the person who led me to all the other girls in the project, uh, you know, passed away. And mm. so that was really a very hard thing to grapple with considering that I had documented her life so closely for 10 months. And then also for all the girls, this was really devastating because she was a lot of the glue of a lot of friendships. So, and it also happened during the summer, which is a very yeah. disjointed time. So what it's one of the things that inspired me to continue to document them for the rest of, uh, for all of these decades, yeah, yeah. because I realized that Molly would remain 17 and the rest of them would grow up. So uh, this particular picture is in September of 86, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the first times the girls are getting together after the initial uh, yeah. memorial service. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for sharing that. It's, uh, you know, I can really feel that in this picture. Um, so yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Let me see here. And then that takes us to this actually, Karen, and that the point I wanted to share this is a and thank you for sharing a couple pages spreads from the book actually so this does two things this is showing um, molly's memorial um, at the bronx high school of science and this is the part of the book that moves somewhat back in time and again forward in time very quickly so what are we looking at the right side of the page here uh on the right side it's actually when uh, we shift paper uh mm -hmm. there's a couple of shifts in paper there's four different papers that are used in the book. Uh, and so this one is a little bit see-through. So you're actually seeing what's bleeding through is uh, a, a, a middle school, an archival middle school picture mm -hmm. of some of them. Mm -hmm. So there's there's some things we play with and I'm not gonna get totally into That's it fine. now, <laughs> uh, but there's a bit of backwards and forwards that we play with as far as time. That's the demarcation from uh, Molly's death into uh, sort of what I'll call a reverb and then the, what happens later. Mm. So when you're sitting down and, and we can stay within the story, but also now we'll transition to a little bit into the actual production of the book. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage, you know, 30 years worth of materials and what I know it's a silly could take all day, but this kind of a thing is so effective. This kind of moment within the book just really took my breath away as I was looking through it um, to remind us, not only of you know the girls as children and in but also that shift from black and white to color that thing that pictures do when they move between black and white and color is really powerful the way we access the pictures in memory so how did you get to this does this kind of thing happen when you sit down with your designer or is because i know you've made many iterations of zines and different books well there's so many different elements to this what i'll call documentary inquiry mm -hmm. and there is a point where, you know, so in 1990, I made an audio piece uh, mm -hmm. that actually was on a reel to reel tape in a radio station with uh, somebody I knew who um, was a was a producer. Um, and we went in and interviewed some of the girls when they were 20, mm -hmm. because I had already started making iterations of a book and realized that I really needed their voices. And then I loved their voices. And remember back in 1990, we didn't have all of the different ways in which we could easily collect audio or video. Mm -hmm. I also started to shoot video. I did different iterations of video. There's like four different types of technological, you know, iterations of 
how we thought of, you know, from high A to digi beta, digi cam, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so what started happening basically by the mid nineties, and I'm going to say my inquiry got messy in a good sort of way, because mm -hmm. I started adding all these different medias and I didn't know exactly what I was going to end up with. So to go back to your question about the color, it's like I also was collecting ephemera after Molly mm -hmm. passed away. I had, uh, you know, some of her diary entries, uh, those those middle school pictures, one of the gens, there's two gens in the book, but she gave me a few pictures from middle school. Mm -hmm. I didn't know them when they were in middle school. So there are different, mm. you know, the video I was shooting was in color. I was still shooting black and white. Um, so there's just ways in which uh, sort of modernity started coming in and then right. well, I'm calling it modernity, but then that became dated really that's fast. That's right, that's right. That's also real, but that's, it's really beautiful to see that as well. And also kind of funny when you're going through these different materials. And I love that, that you're that, I mean, I'll say that, that documentary urge um, to keep digging and finding other ways of telling the story, not, not only the images, but the audio or, or just even the introduction of, of writing of the journal or these images, you said, Jen gave you a few from middle school. Right. What a way to expand the project. So many times, you know, people are working on projects and they feel kind of stuck, right? And there's no rules to like how to open up and expand a, 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 a project, a visual audio project. So that is something that just takes a lot of time, right, Karen? And you can't come yes. to that right and, away. And the other thing is talk about like when you, so so at a certain point, and I've actually written about this just mm -hmm. in a more like the more, you know, Professor Marshall part of things mm -hmm. is the fact that it's not just about the women getting older, it's about photography changing. Yeah. And photography kept changing over this time and the kind of cameras we were using and what was in fashion and what, how, and I changed. So mm -hmm. when I started doing video and I actually brought them together in a room a number of times, I was no longer a fly on the wall. I was the one bringing them together. I became part of it. If you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. my, my imprint came in. There's no longer That's some right. verte going on. That's right. So there's all of that as well, that I had to call together and play with and I had boxes and I, I kept everything. So boxes and boxes of even Xeroxes of right. things for book dummies, you know? So this is all part of almost the pile I was left with when it was time to start to think about first the exhibition, but then later the book. Absolutely. And I, I do think that's so important for folks that maybe are listening in on how to, you know, it can be, it can be exciting, but also extremely frustrating when you decide to work on a book project, right? Because it feels like an ending, but all of these other materials are just opening this up in a really beautiful, interesting way. And I was wondering, Tom, do you mind playing a short audio? We have about a minute of this audio. Sure, here and we go. Karen, Karen, will you set it up? I'm sorry. It's a, the girl speaking. Oh, oh, yes, yes. So this 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 piece that we're sharing, which is basically about a minute of a twelve minute uh, audio piece that I did in nineteen ninety. So there there um, twenty here. What in the book? There are several pages where there are QR codes. So mm -hmm. if you want to listen, you can listen. And there's also later on in the book. There's also. Uh, other interviews I did when they were 39, though those mm. are in video. So, so there are times where you can hear them pondering. So this Thank is you. one of them, yeah. And this is Jen P, there's two Jens in the very beginning here. And sort of a stock pile of images that end, turn up in your dreams and there's whole parts of your consciousness that just slip into the back. And then when you have time to sit down, um, things creep up and for me it's a lot of just like places you know there's certain places that things happened in you know even if i went back there it wouldn't be the same it may meant something then it means something now that i can't return to it we're still creating ourselves i'm definitely still creating myself that whole period for me is things making me and me making myself and trying to figure out what was going on and who i was and that's me that's how i let someone know who i am now Mm -hmm. taking things aside putting everything aside for a while and having space that's just us it's just 
two women who can relate to each other, um, who are helping each other, helping each other grow. So powerful to think, think about that and look through the images at the same time. Thank you, Tom. And then just quickly, we yep. have, thank you. Um, I just wanted to share the scope of, of the different materials that Karen mentioned in the technology, if you will, and how it's was so modern and how it's changed. Uh, and in the QR code or in, I know in a, an installation you had, could you speak to, you had, you call it the old school video and you have some old school video on the installation in an old, you know, uh, TV monitor. Mm -hmm. And you chose to not show, not have audio. So we're watching the gestures of the women. Could you speak to that choice? Yeah. Okay. So there's all these different times I brought them together. And at one point, I actually thought I was making a video and it, I played with some video editor and we put together a five minute trailer. And then I looked at it and I go, no way. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing a video about a photography project. That's not right. what this is. So then again, I just still kept on kind of gathering them. And I gotta be honest with you, there's some amazing things that they all said at these meetings. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it was like, it was just so much. And I wanted to boil everything down. Like it just had, like, how do you extract? Right. And I also, one of the things I wanted to articulate in when I was doing the installation is how the documentary inquiry technologically kept changing. So I made a decision that I was going to throw, show three of the iterations of video groupings that I had, that it became like home movies. And I worked with an editor. We actually made it like we sped it up. We changed the time. We basically deconstructed mm -hmm. it into an idea of gestures. And so there are three yeah. different iterations of old school, what I call old school video. Digi, uh, hi, a digi. Digi beta and then digi cam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting because when I watch those at first, you know, I'm not, it's a, it's an interesting experience to watch those old, you know, uh, I mean, to me, it's like VHS, it's probably the wrong, but you know how it reads to me in that way. And there's no sound. And it's, it really has me kind of thinking about why, first of all, why would we have no sound? But then you get so lost in the gestures of the women speaking to one another that doesn't actually matter what they're saying because you, you have a sense of that feeling of what they're saying to one another already just by watching their gesture. So I think that's that was a really interesting choice as well in the installation, which we'll show. And then we don't have to go through each of these, but just to give the viewers a, a, an idea of the scope of the, the materials involved. And then, and then just briefly to go through, so this is Leslie now in um, 1994, and then we won't show all of it here, but when you get it, when you look at the book project, there are more recent, very recent pictures of the women, which is really exciting to see where they are now in life. And Karen, you're welcome to speak about any of these images if you'd like to. Yeah, I mean, these are them when they're fairly young, they're, mm -hmm. you know, in their first apartments, uh, you know, first or second jobs. Uh, the majority of them, especially in the early years, all were still staying in Manhattan, though, mm -hmm. both in Leslie and this Gen G, they're both, they both lived uh, downtown Manhattan, they no longer lived, they had originally lived uptown, so now they right. live downtown. Uh, you know, so so these are just uh, earlier visits. And then the other thing that obviously happened at times was that they're um, I'm, I'm meeting with them alone. They're not mm -hmm. they're not seeing each other. They're individuals with new friends. So mm -hmm. it was a different checking. In. Exactly. Right. The other people coming. This, uh, this is, is Blake's wedding. Amazing. So Blake, that 1994 is pretty early on. Yes. Okay. She got married really early and you'll find out in the in, in, in the, the audio book. and things like that, <laughs> that she, this was something she actually always had a clear intention that she, mm. she wanted to have children. She wanted to have them young. And that was, you know, her and path. she was the first of the women to, she was the path. first of the women okay. to get married. Yeah. And then 2000. So Blake Griffin, who's the new one and Jen. Then right. So, one. so this is this is Blake's second child that's on her chest mm. and you can't see it here, but 
uh, Jen is actually pre very pregnant as well. Okay. And so they had been very close friends in high school. And then this is many years later. Mm, so it's 15 years into the, mm -hmm. yeah, 15 years into the project. Great. And this is during uh, actually a video shoot that we did in uh, an apartment Blake lived in at that mm -hmm. time uh, mm -hmm. on the west side in Manhattan. Yeah, um, and so that's Leslie, Blake, and Jen. Mm -hmm. And this, I believe, is part. Yeah, you said the part of that video, and that's when you can really see the movement between them and what they're speaking about, both laughter and kind of not sadness, but there are some serious moments. And then here, um, I really wanted to share this so folks get an idea of the scope of both the project physically, Karen, but also, again, it's that, that impulse to keep digging and digging and digging and, and what to do with all of that ephemera. So this is a little bit older. This is a 2008 installation. Um, Actually, and, this is a 2015 installation. Oh, this is 2015. Okay. Matter. Sorry, it was first created. Okay, so this yeah. is 2015. So we're looking at the images. There are about, is it 20 images? At that there, size, I know there's a lot. Yeah, there. So, so basic. Remember, I originally started this with uh, these are silver gelatin images. Right. So these are 16 by 20 silver gelatin uh, pictures of the original grouping of the first year. And then uh, in this installation, I also have I had two vitrine boxes with mm -hmm. the project ephemera. Right. And I also had a number of zines where you can kind of they're almost like catalogs of different girls and then you just put on the screen that's the old school video where you have three different iterations of soundless uh video that goes on and there's also a room you also see on the other side there's a projection room uh the way i'd originally designed this is supposed to be for three walls i couldn't do that in this mm. particular space so it ends up on one wall but this way you can go into a dark room and listen to them at the age of 39. Mm. with a lot of the same kinds of questions, but some more advanced questions of what the audio piece was. And the audio piece uh, in the installation, I've used it where you can, you know, there's a dial up number and you could listen to it as you walked around the exhibition if you wanted to. Mm. Thank you. And then just the last one I think I have here is um, the, the, what did I cut? I think the zines is the next one. The vitrines, you had, could you talk a little bit about? Yeah, them? so there were two vitrines. One vitrine was more based on Molly and stuff about her and after she passed away. The other vitrine had, uh, as I said, the project stuff. So like, you know, when I first was doing this, I was also, sell you know, in those days, you actually could sell your pick. Like there were a lot of print magazines, but I realized I had like, a spread from a Ms. magazine when it was still a right. commercial press, and a spread from a very short-lived uh, magazine called Seven Days. And I realized that the graphics was almost, it was this very like 1980s graphic, yes. and it was the same. So you had that. I also have a rejection letter from Aperture Magazine saying that because I had sent them a proposal for, for a book, and they wrote me back saying, we really like love the work but unfortunately we're about to publish a book called about 12 by a photographer named sally Mann. yes so it was before sally ended up having really it was her about first 12. book yeah so they couldn't do anything with it because they had a teenage book coming out so i always <sighs> think that is just hysterically funny uh, <laughs> it is and one of that one of my favorite bodies of work and completely different than this body yeah, of work completely different <laughs> But it, it's just, and then the other thing too, I had in the vitrine boxes is also some of this technology, yes. like this kind of cassette or that kind of VHS or whatever else. And then you also see on the top there, you see, I, I created because I have so many uh, Xeroxes from all the different times I tried right. to do book dummies that I ended up doing like a, a, a four and a half by eight foot uh, poster with like, whatever that stuff, you know, I made, I used, um, you know, it's called like mudge hey, or yeah, something mudge like that. I did, it, it, I, I basically made a collage. Right. That, by the way, we didn't use the collage in the book. It's like, it, right. we didn't need it. It didn't really work. Uh, right. But it was, it's fun here. Well, and also it speaks and it makes sense. It's not in the book, Karen, because this is about process. This is about an artist, you know, a, a, a visual person working out the iteration and making sense of it, right? So it doesn't all need to be in the book. And that, yeah. that I love, that I love that it is not all in the book. And, you know, I'm a zine lover, you know, I love 
that idea of making things. And so I just wanted to share the many kind of iterations of sequencing. I think you have this as editing, sequencing and cataloging. So, if, you know, viewers can go through these at that exhibition. Yeah, and um, it's like, again, it's like a lot of those pictures don't exist in the book because we're not going to show them all and it's yeah. not this wasn't even supposed to be like high art or great exactly it's about cataloging it was about this notion of the documentary inquiry absolutely absolutely so then now after all this time we have this beautiful you know beautifully made i haven't actually held it but i have an idea of the materials we talked about it i know <laughs> This beautifully made, fully realized book that is um, due, it's already been, it's already created, it's already published right in Germany. No, it's about to come out. It will be out like in the next week or two. Okay. I think it's like next week is the uh, the pub date for, okay. for Europe. And just because of how distribution works in the United States, the pub date for the US is October. Um, so. So how does that, so this is the last of the slides I have to show, mm -hmm. and then we can jump off and yeah. just get in conversation. And there's a few questions, but, you know, as an artist working through 30 years of making this work, um, you know, does the book, I know, does the book feel like our work is never done, right? But does the, how does the book feel in comparison, right, to an exhibition or these other iterations? Do you feel it's I don't want to use the word closed and you have Molly beautifully this beautiful portrait of Molly on the cover in red. Does it feel that you've reached whatever that material goal is or that conceptual goal? Yeah, I just, you know, I'm not going to, I could really go on and on about this and I won't today. Uh, but <laughs> we have a little time. The thing was, is that when I made the audio piece in 1990 and then I had like black and white pictures and I had this 12 minute audio and I was like, I put the black and white pictures as slides. And then I had like a dog and pony show, you know, mm -hmm. I would like give a lecture and you'd hear the audio and you'd have that. And I was like, where's the technology? And I was always waiting yes. as different demarcations of technology came in. And what I feel about the book now, because it's so easy with like a QR code and things yeah. like that is that I actually have something that people can hold in their hands that reads as a narrative that can be carried across the world, across the globe and shared. And so in a sense, I finally arrived at the technology. Oh, it's and I think bookmaking as well arrived at that place. And so even though I actually still want to do at, you know installations and I think they're wonderful and I think they're interactive and I think they can create other kinds of public programs, for teenagers and old people and everything else, which I think is marvelous. Uh, I think the thing about a book is it has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And I've always made a joke just because they were teenagers is that I wanted this work to be able to go to like to grow up, go to college and then have its own career. And so I feel like that's what the book is. <laughs> oh, that's and as its mother as a mothering it for over three decades. It's time for it to go have a life on its own. <laughs> oh, beautifully said, beautifully said. I love that a book became, you know, this notion of a book, this thing we've had around since before all the other technologies, right, that you've even talked about, is now the container for all these other pieces. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So with that, I will end our visual part. <laughs> Karen, that was so beautifully said. I love it. And I will stop my share here. And Shelly, how are we doing on time? You are perfect. You're landing right on time because we've got a number of questions that have come in and they're, I would say they're equally divided between curiosity about the girls and their family and, and sort of their trajectory and then also the process. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we'll start with process first and then mm -hmm. um, try that. Um, there's, and I'm going to kind of group a few things together. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's one one specifically that a couple of people have been asking is like just the the raw amount of material that you have and how overwhelming that must be you know did you bring in an editor who how did you decide to do that what and then specific question what should we look for in an editor to work with on a long-term project like this mm. so first of all like i i consider myself a photographer's editor mm -hmm. that's what i do with mm -hmm. the people i mentor so there's a certain amount of that that I do naturally. Um, so there's that part of it. Um, 
but and then there were a lot of people I tried to bring in and none of it ever worked. Um, but ultimately, I brought in uh, a designer, um, Toon van der Hogen, and he was able to, he's brilliant. And as I consider him, he's the architect of this book. He built the house for it. And I needed someone to build the house. Yes. I had all of the elements, but I didn't have the house. And I've got to say there were other, there were people I consulted with over the years. And usually I walked away from most of those going, thank you very much. You gave me like a quarter mm -hmm. of a percent, but you really didn't give me anything. And I, and you know, I think that also designing, doing the installation really helped me a lot because then I started to see it as an archive. Like yes. I had to get to that point first and then I could see the rest of it. And in 2015, and I had this opportunity to have a really big space to do an installation. That's in a 10 day time period. I traveled around the country and photographed the women in the project. And I kind of knew then that that was, that was it. 30 years was totally enough time. And then I was really ready to sort of, um, I was ready to put it into its final thing. Mm. I love that idea of the, the, the book, you said the, the architect. So your designer is the architect that houses it. That's the struggle so many people have. They've got all these materials right. and we're so close to our work. We're too close to our own work to look at it, right? Often. Great. And Thank it's you. also not a straight, as you put it, Leslie, it's like, it's, it's linear, but then it's non-linear. And I actually think that's what women's relationships are. Yes. They are, they are linear and non-linear at the same time and emblematic yeah. relationships, any friendships, and that's even, you know, it's not a gender oriented thing, but emblematic relationships are non-linear. It means that you could not talk to somebody for 15 years, yes. but you know them from a certain time period. And all you have to do is three grunts and they know exactly what's going on with you. And so exactly. that's kind of how the book, hopefully the book reads a little like that too. <laughs> I mean, I think it does right when you get to that center, I don't even know if it's in the center. I don't want to say, but when you get to that transition that I shared from the black and white to color, many things happen there. And that's one of yeah. them. You're just moved through time and you're reminded that you could just call, hopefully you can call someone and like you mm -hmm. said, grunts and <laughs> you're back at it. Yeah. Thank but you. it's, I think it's really important. I just going to say that I think it's, there's so many things, there's so much time I spent on it, but I also, there's just no way this book was going to be like some kind of like traditional photo book. Yeah. And again, even the waiting of time, I really think that we're at a wonderful moment in photo books that we can see them in unique new ways. And, yes. and so that's, it's also about that timing. Mm -hmm. So just getting back to timing again, this was um, a couple of um, weaved into a couple of questions was, I mean, did you start out thinking this was a 30 year project? What was your original timeline? Six months, a year? <laughs> what was your... I had no idea. I was photographing a group of girls who were 16 and they turned 17. Right. And then, you know, there was the loss of a friend and that threw everything into a whole other thing. And I, that's when I realized I couldn't stop. And I actually, at that moment, I was like, oh, I didn't even know when the end was. Like, I thought maybe somewhere in the back of my head, I felt like, okay, when they graduate from high school, that will be it. I'll follow them through senior year, sort of maybe. Right. But that threw me into this thing, like, I have to watch them get older. And every demarcation, every time I brought them together or I met them, it was like, is this the end? Is this the end? And let me tell you, it, it was a lot of responsibility. And it's also... I just want to say something up to like younger people, which is that, you know, sometimes we work on projects and within eight months, they are published, they're out there, they're well known, mm -hmm. it's amazing. But mm -hmm. sometimes we work on projects and it's like a type of, it's like a fermentation yes. and it's not about that. So as a, as a ambitious photographer, I had to like swallow a lot. I was like, this isn't ready yet. Now it's not ready yet. Yes. It's not ready again. I mean, I did, let me tell you, I mean, it was, the work was used in different places at different times, but it was, people didn't know who I was or what I was doing. Cause half of what I was doing was, was like behind the scenes. So that's, but you know what? I'm very proud of that too. So I think it's not, it, it sometimes things come later. They're not about oversharing early. 
Right. And you, in between all that time, you also were, had a robust practice, not only teaching and mentors, but your own photographic practice. You have yeah. other bodies of work. We could do a whole hour on just, you know, Yeah, I have tons so, of other work I did. And working. then I also had a daughter who That's ended right. up growing up in New York city, going to LaGuardia uh, right. school for, for uh, the arts, the same school, some of them went to. And then weirdly, while I'm working on the project, I would walk into my into a room in my apartment and there would be my daughter with like a bunch of girls lying around and it looked exactly the same. <laughs> so that I don't know if that's research or not but but what it did show me was that exactly what I always felt that it was this was there was a universality to this yes. that that did not that extended past time and one other thing too is my premise was always like yeah these are new york city kind of like middle class girls of a very particular ethnic background because that's the neighborhood they were in. But I have, heard, over the years as the work has been published in various places, I've heard from young women around the globe who look different than these girls going, thank you, Karen. Like, I realized that we all are doing this. We're all doing this. There's something about this. So that's also, you know, part of it. Yeah. So. Um, just a couple more questions and then uh, we've got some wrap up to do, but I, I, I think this is a burning question on a lot of people's minds is, and I'm going to combine it is like, have the girls like with the publication of the book, have the girls been in touch and, and, you know, and have they seen with each other and with you on this? And then also what about Molly's family and, and their feelings for the project and the publication? Yeah. Um, in 2015, we had the installation, everyone like Molly's family plus all the women except for one that is in Oregon who couldn't make it um, all came together. So we all saw each other then and had an enormous celebration. But the people who have remained, the women who have remained in the project have remained in the project. And I think they're super excited. They might also be a little nervous. I have no idea about that piece of it. Um, but, you know, this was, you know, a lot of times I have students who will talk about like, a documentary this is a collaborative documentary and it's like my opinion on this is that any documentary is collaborative and this is like mm -hmm. this and there's one woman who chose at a certain point to be deleted from the project which you know i politely did and that kind of thing happens even in friendships where sometimes people decide they don't want to engage anymore um so everyone here wanted to participate and you know i think from you know i could start crying right now um but for molly's family it was sort of a gift that there was this this documentation and i certainly know that um in a couple of weeks when i get my first copies i'll get a few of the you know first hot off the press copies that one of the first things i'll do is go and bring one of them to molly's mom yeah so yeah yeah, that, that must be, that's going to be a powerful moment, I think, for them to see mm -hmm. that. Wow. Um, okay, uh, we have a just, um, Leslie, do you want to ask the last question? And then we'll, we'll go into the wrap up of the session or? I mean, I haven't seen the Q&A, but Karen, is there anything you'd like to add or, or anything that we haven't covered about? And, and we can also talk about that. your upcoming, any upcoming projects that you both are working mm -hmm. on Thank that, you. that the audience can watch out for besides this one <laughs> right now i'm sort of overwhelmed in this one so i'm not gonna actually do that yeah it's kind of a goofy thing that i have two uh two different um pub dates but that's how it is there'll mm -hmm. be a lot of activity in the fall here in the united states yes um on this book so you can look out for that and uh other than that there is a pre-sale of my book that is available on my website. It's Karen Marshall photo. It's actually, it was the wrong uh, website. If you go to just karenmarshall.com, it's somebody in the UK, I think. So it's Karen Marshall photo uh, if you want to reserve a copy because it is a limited amount. And that's that. And yeah, if you want to be, you can also email me if you want to be on my uh, newsletter to find out about other things. But thank you so much. It was really great to be here. Great. Yeah, I think we have the Carol, Carol Marshall photo in the chat box. Yes. Right. And I did have it correct in the presentation because I just got really paranoid, but it was correct. Yeah. Karen Marshall photo. Yes. I would hate to have done that, Karen. Um, 
No, I mean, I just, I, I just want to highlight and lift that. I think this book is really, um, I'm trying to think of a better word than, you know, smart, but this notion of all of these technologies coming together within a book format and the way that you think about kind of the timeline and history of these tools of photography, these ways we tell story or audio photography, for me, it's all anything lens-based or audio. It's, it's, um, it's something really special. And I, I love that this story, this intimate close to home story about just relationships was the subject of all of these things coming together. You know, I don't know if I'm saying that very well, but it could be a story far away from home. It could be something political, but it's a very intimate story using all of these various tools. And I just, I really love that, Karen. So I also, I want to say, I'm interrupting one last thing I want to no. say. I think the we're talking about timing. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely intriguing to me that we have spent a year and a half separated yes. from our set from each other that this is coming out it makes perfect sense that this is coming out at a time where we haven't been able to be with our friends <laughs> right i mean and also shelly to, to your yeah to your question you know about what's next for karen i i think that um you know it's the perfect time to come out because we're going to celebrate and be together hopefully and enjoy this this work um yeah, and Shelly, did you want me to share? Do I have one second to? Yes, yes, please do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So I'm working away on um, don't ever want a book project because it's so much work. But as soon our publication, um, I'm working with WPR Women Fiction Revolution. My co-creator, um, Zoraida Lopez Diago, and I have this book coming out. Uh, it's a, a volume um, of um, essays and a curated selection of images on the representation of Black motherhood in contemporary photography. We're really so excited. We've had a very generous publisher who's been very patient with our, um, our full-time work, our mothering. My kids have been in remote school for a year. Things just really slowed down. Zoraida, I think it's okay to say, just had a, a new baby last week, so we, the family is growing. Um, so that's going on and then just continuing with my um, ICP family and community programs and continuing education I have a couple classes coming up. Um, but I think this summer we should all just try to change it up a little bit and uh, enjoy ourselves and jump in a lake or whatever you have access to <laughs> before we start the fall because it's going to be a busy one. Um, but yeah, so thank you, Shelly, so much. And thanks, Joe and Tom and Karen. Of course, it's my honor and privilege to sit with you and, and learn Pleasure. about this project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for joining us. It's been a, a fascinating hour long conversation that we could keep going for another hour because I know there were other questions that we weren't able to get to. And before we sign off, I just want to tell for the people who are based in Washington, D.C. Yes, um, we have um, a terrific opening that's happening today at Union Market in, in D.C. It's called Giving Black Women Their Flowers. It's a perfect way to, to mark Juneteenth. Um, a wonderful photography um, exhibit um, celebrating Black women who are on the front lines of, of the uh, liberation movement for Black people in America. So I uh, want to flag that for people who are interested and can attend. And thanks everyone for coming. Leslie, we look forward to more collaboration next year. Karen, hope the same with you as well. And good luck on, on the book. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a wonderful time and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.